Okay. So basically what I shared with you guys last week was a little bit of my own story, but also within that buried deep is a story of a high achiever. And I talk about it particularly to this audience because I know so many of you are very high achievers and um, what comes with that is very often and ironically a sense that you're ordinary and that you are not as far along and as high achieving as you think you are. And don't ask me why that's true, but I think that those of us, particularly women, who have worked hard and are high achievers and high performers, we don't realize uh, how much we're kind of sitting on a pot of gold. Uh, and we tend to step over what it is that we're good at. So I very much had this good little girl where I had a great resume, I built a really strong resume, I made mom and dad happy until that was all the way through my 20s. And then somehow when I turned 30, it started to all crumble. And I realized that I wasn't happy doing the job that I was doing and I needed to find one that suited me better. Why do I say this? I say it because to think that you can go to Columbia or the new school or NYU, get a graduate degree or whatever level you guys are at and imagine that it's all gonna be solved forever. It doesn't work that way. And the other thing that I've seen, I've literally worked with hundreds of women at this point and, and men too, but it happens to both. Somewhere around age 30, it's like we spend our 20s doing the right thing, learning how to be professionals. And then suddenly around 30, you kind of look and you say, oh my God, I'm gonna be doing this for the rest of my life. And it is a time for many, and even if not all of you on this call are near that time, there often is a transition in the early stages of career where you realize you wanna change your mind. And, uh, and it can feel really hard or depressing to think about being in the current job that you're in for a very long time. So I'm just setting that stage. Ah, what happened? I'm just setting the stage. Why is it misbehaving? So a couple of things where I say finding your dream has its challenges. One of the biggest requests I get is um, there's two things. First of all, give me a roadmap, right? So that I can focus. But the second thing is help me figure out what I want. And my argument to you is that it's not actually as difficult as we think it is to figure out what we want, but there are some obstacles in the way. Uh, one obstacle is our inner voice, our inner critic. You know, we've started down one path, Maybe we're happy, maybe we're not. Um, but I think for many of us, we've worked so hard that there's this question of like, is it even possible? And I can remember when I was doing marketing um, in a cosmetics company and I loved the company. I loved my team, everything was great, but I really hated the job. And uh, it didn't seem logical to me that I could have come so far and then not like the job, I thought something was wrong with me. So number one, is it really possible? Number two, literally is what do I want? Um, and it, there is a methodology, there's a way to figure it out, which is to begin listening to yourself. And we're gonna talk about that today. And then the third part is, you know, how do I get it? Um, and we started last week on the idea of the, the messaging, and we're gonna do that again a little bit this week, okay? So, number one, I guess my question to you is, where are you? And I'm assuming, and maybe some of you are super happy in your jobs and you wanna to go to the next level, and that's great. So, you know, use this, what do I want to help you 
articulate how you could sell yourself to your management to actually go to the next level and take on more responsibility. But I think many of you are on this call because it just seems like, how did I get here? I worked so hard, I, you know, I don't know what I want, or I'm still early in my career. If there's any undergraduates who still have no sense of what you want and you're a little panicked, like, when is it gonna come? You know, when am I gonna figure it out? Um, so my advice in this first part is, it is actually possible to figure out what you want. It is possible to shift in careers. I've done it twice. Um, and if you're not feeling super happy every minute of every day, it is actually possible uh, that you deserve and have the right to a job that suits you. And it's possible to find it, okay? So this is what I was saying. It happens to the best of us. I had built a resume. This is my plastic cardboard resume and I make it intentionally gray looking because I wasn't excited about it. You know, it was, I had built it, but I didn't actually like what I was doing. So what we're gonna talk about today is understanding who you are and where you fit into a system, okay? So we talked, uh, last week, a little bit about assessments. You look at the Myers Briggs, you might look at the social style, the Strengths Finder. Then you look at self reflection, you look into peak experiences. And then 360 feedback from friends and colleagues. And hopefully, what happens, like in any good Venn diagram, where you have the combination of these three, you end up finding something where it's almost undeniable, right? So uh, whatever it is that you're really good and talented at, it becomes undeniable. You hear it from so many different sources that you begin to know and understand yourself. So um, those of you who were with us last week, we've talked about the Myers-Briggs, the social style, the StrengthsFinder 2.0 as ways to both learn about yourself and also develop a language for talking about transferable skills, okay? Um, feedback from friends and colleagues can be incredibly important and I'll share with you um, at the end a, uh, a, a letter where you can actually ask for feedback, but today we're gonna do the self-reflection and peak experiences. So what I want you to do for this is that I want you to think about a time in your life where you really felt fully alive. Um, you were excited, you were energized, uh, time was passing quickly, you didn't even notice it, you were lost in what you were doing. And as you think about this, I would invite you not to think about, you know, in a, in a crowd like this, who, where there's a lot of achievement and success, um, I often hear, I don't have any peak experiences. I don't have any major accomplishments. They don't have to be major accomplishments to be a peak experience. And I can share that one of the experiences I had very early in my life is that in the United States, we often have summer jobs in high school. And uh, I had a summer job that I actually had for two years after school part-time, and it was uh, serving ice cream at Baskin Robbins, which was the local ice cream place in my town. And that was one peak experience. Later on, I uh, taught ski school to little five-year-old children in Vermont. I would go on weekends and uh, I taught ski school. Another peak experience I had was once I had the opportunity to teach some high school kids. These were um, kids from uh, disadvantaged families who were in a uh, scholarship program. So they were in some of New York City's most elite private schools but because they themselves didn't come from wealthy families, they needed a lot of support. So every weekend they would get together as a group 
um, and they would have mentoring and tutoring and all of that. And I got to go in one Saturday and spend an hour and a half teaching them interview skills so that they could uh, interview for college. And I remember that experience for about an hour and a half, I couldn't stop. I was like floating. I was so excited. And when you put those three together, what you get is something around like, you know, it's not that I wanted to teach inner, kitty, inner city kids for the rest of my life. It's not that I wanted a job outdoors teaching small children how to ski, but the common thread was teaching. Um, and in the end, what I do now is a lot of adult learning. Um, so when you think about these peak experiences, think about just times that for you felt meaningful. Okay, and I'll give you a few minutes to think of one or maybe two. Ideally, this is an exercise that you do on your own, where you look at actually seven peak experiences, and then you write about them, you journal about them, and you break them down. So I'll give you about 30 more seconds to think about something that felt like a peak experience for you. And then just journal right now, take a minute to journal or a couple of minutes I'll give you. What were you doing? Who were you with? What motivated you? What did you learn? What role did you play? And by role, I don't mean what was the job title, but I mean, were you, you know, the one who was up in front of the audience presenting? Were you in front of the client? Or were you in a role where you were putting the finishing touches onto um, a presentation so that it would be perfect or a report, you know, were you doing analysis and research, right? So what role did you play? And then what was your impact? So how did you help the others that you were working with? Or if not others, if you were doing this alone, what was the impact of the project or Okay, so would anybody be willing to share right here? I'd love to hear some of these. Maybe just one or two. Um, Julie, how do we look at raised hands? Hmm. I, you have to op open up the participant list. No one has raised their hands yet. Feel free to either raise your hand or put yeah, it in the chat. Raise your hand if you want to share or if you want a little bit of coaching. Shy today. I know everybody's shy. That's all right. Somebody will come up. I can start. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, so I thought back to a volunteer experience or general set of volunteering experiences I've had. Um, I volunteer in the medical tent at a lot of the like New York City races. Um, and um, that was a peak moment for me, like, or when I thought of like the peak moment, it was when I, uh, when like the tent was super busy and like things were running around and everyone sort of needed to just like dive in and help and like talk to, you know, kind of get patients moving in and out of the tent and just being at the top of their game. Um, and just that moment of like feeling like I was a part of something greater and working with other folks who, um, who were also sort of had that same mission and all working together to get something done. Like that feeling was really um, powerful. Yeah. 
Yeah, great. So, okay, Caroline, I want you to take notes. Ready? Mm -hmm. Even just in that moment, there's so much to pull apart. And so a couple of things I'm hearing. Um, you like being part of a mission, right? Something mm -hmm. greater. And that's important from, we're going to go over in a minute, the difference between the tasks and the job, uh, the ro you know, the role, the sorts of tasks you like to do, and the environment or the culture in which you like to do them. Mm. So what you're describing is that you like a culture where everybody's in it together, mm -hmm. you know, where everybody is um, qualified, highly qualified to do what they're doing. Um, they have a mission. It sounds like you have a very, uh, you like the immediacy of this moment, mm -hmm. which, which is, and it's interesting that it's a marathon, right? Because <laughs> those, mo those intense, like moments of intensity, uh, you may actually thrive in that. Like maybe you'd be great in an emergency room. Or maybe it's just a moment in time and actually it would be overwhelming if you did that every day, mm -hmm. um, you know, for years and years. But so it's interesting that now what that also means is that you like to have highly qualified people around you. Mm -hmm. right? People who also know what the mission is, feel unified in that mission. Right. And that is more of an environment that you want to be in. Right? You're smiling. <laughs> I've never heard someone phrase it like that, and it's so spot on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think, look, one of the incredible benefits of being so highly educated is that if you're lucky, you get to be around a lot of other people who know a lot. Mm -hmm. You can dive in and, and do some really incredible things together. Um, now, from a, from a task point of view, right? are you generally... Like in those moments of, it sounds like a little bit chaotic in the tent and you mm -hmm. have to stay calm and stay cool, right? Right. Right. And you, ha you look like you have a demeanor that's pretty low key. <laughs> Is that fair or, or am I getting it wrong? When you say low key, do you mean like, I'm not sure what you mean by that? Well, sometimes in a team, you see some people that are very like, come on, let's go, you know, and then you see other people who are unflappable. So if the client delivers bad news, you stay calm. Mm -hmm. Like when you see in legal shows and they're like, don't let the jury see you. you know? <laughs> and, and I'm wondering, and obviously there's a lot in between, but I'm wondering where, uh, do you have like you help not quietly necessarily but steadily and you're you have a, a steady energy that is sometimes i call it unflappable uh-huh where you people don't freak out you calm people is right that true or is that the wrong kind of energy um i would say so yeah i think i definitely um am pretty calm under what would traditionally be stressful situations yeah so when you think about how you can help a team and contribute, that sort of calm is very meaningful to people. Mm. Um, so what does that mean? It could mean, and what you're describing is that you're a little bit the port in the storm. Now I'm being, you know, we're talking for <laughs> sure. few minutes. So I'm, I'm, I'm making some leaps here. But that could mean that you actually like a very dynamic environment, something where, like, you don't want to necessarily be in a law firm or be an accountant where it's everybody's steady. You right. actually like a little action. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's a startup, maybe it's a very dynamic, fast paced environment, but you are the one who people look to for a sense of calm. Mm. You know? Yeah. So what resonates in there and, or doesn't? Um, I think what you most recently said about like uh, liking a sense of like dynamic kind of environment, like definitely a big part of me is, I, I like the sound of like startups and kind of always, like that energy, that bustling energy is something that calls out to me. Um, even though like to your point, um, I definitely am a lot more like I'm calm in those situations. I, I don't have any interest in sort of being in a place where everything's always like flat. Yeah. Um, and uh, what you, I think the thing that you said like early on that struck me most was definitely just like 
mm. being around highly qualified people. Like I had never thought about it like that, that way. Um, but I think that's an accurate statement and that I, I like, right. I like being around sort of like-minded or, or folks who like, right. Know, know what they're doing and sort of are, are united around something. Yeah. And that, so, and that kind of intellectual complexity, um, can also point to things like, uh, you know, consulting, management consulting, things that are really cerebral and challenging mm -hmm. um, and problem solving and things like that can, can often be very uh, enticing to that kind of a, I know in cosmetics, I loved a lot about cosmetics, but it wasn't always, <laughs> you know, quite as cerebral in the kinds of uh, challenges we were faced with as, as I sometimes would have liked. But, you know, management consulting, uh, right? There's a lot that does, so good. Um, Jesse has her hand up as well. Okay, good, I see another raised hand. So Caroline, I hope that's helpful. That was, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, Sophia. Hi, so I, oh, Chelsea. Yeah, Chelsea. Chelsea. Thank you. It's nice hearing your story, um, Caroline, by the way. Um, so my experience was being a doula. I think that was kind of like shifting to me. I did it because like I went through something personally and I felt like going a woman going through a whole pregnancy, not having somebody is is very jarring and it shouldn't be that way. And I didn't want them to feel alone. So I would volunteer for this um, nonprofit like near where I lived and was mainly working with like teenage moms, like minority teenage moms. Yeah. That was probably the most shifting experience because that was what led me into thinking about doing a career in medicine. Um, I loved how, you know, you can go in and this was a nonprofit, so it wasn't as structured. So sometimes I'd be going to situations when I did not know them, but yet you can build a bond in like five hours or six hours or seven hours and they trust you because yeah. they did know about what doula was and they had some training in that beforehand. Um, so I love that experience for sure. Wow, that's cool. Um, that is amazing. So you've birthed a lot of babies. Yeah, so yeah, I'm not- You come in after. No, I am in the room. I come in like I get like a phone call and then I go in and it's like a few hours before their birth. And we also do like circles where we talk about like you know, breastfeeding and what it means to yeah. be a mom at our age. Cause I was around, I was a little bit older, but still around like the age that they were yeah. like four years older. Um, and so, are you studying medicine now? Yeah. So I, um, I was, it's funny cause I was an econ major for whatever reasons and like international studies major for, you know, whatever reasons I wanted to, to do it. But now I'm at Columbia, I'm doing the post program. So hoping to get into medicine. Great. Okay, cool. So let's, let's talk about that then a little bit, because you guys see how it's, they're such different. Do you feel the different energies between you and Caroline? Like everybody's so unique, right? Yeah. Um, and so what I'm hearing is something of, there's a, you know, with Caroline, there was a connection to a team, but with you, it's a connection to an individual and a deeply intimate one that's a very personal experience. Um, and not to say there isn't a team around you, certainly there's a huge team when you deliver a baby, but, um, but there's also something about your ability to connect and serve that individual at that time, right? right. There's also, um, in the way you described it, there's an education piece. Mm -hmm. of helping them breastfeed, teaching them how to do this so that they don't feel um, so alone. Mm -hmm. uh, and then obviously there's a lot of technical knowledge that comes with that, right? right? You have to learn and know all of this stuff. Yeah, you have um, stuff. yeah, but it's interesting. The energy I get from you is like a big people, personal, intimate energy. Mm -hmm. Does that resonate or yeah I think it does I think you know I like to describe myself as like an outgoing introvert because <laughs> yeah. I'm very outgoing but there's times that like I like to be on my own <laughs> like just to be alone obviously yeah 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 so yeah. definitely 
I like being around people. I don't want to be like bored in an office or whatever situation. Like I do love being around people on yeah. one basis or one on three, not like one on 50. Yeah. So the environment is like helping people, right? Being of service in a way, um, connecting with people a lot. But then in terms of the tasks that you like to do, right. which parts of being a doula come most naturally to you? Is it like organizing a woman when she gets home? Is it teaching? Is it uh, the emergency of the situation? What? Yeah, that's a great question. I do think it's funny enough because I do think it's an emergency of it because when you're in a birth like there's also the family members that are there and a lot of the times even though you can be the youngest person in the room they still look to you for advice yeah. so just giving people like oh like why don't you do this like put the towel over her head or why don't you like make sure this is okay dad and make sure and like giving everybody these roles like it made them feel really happy because maybe they didn't know like they were in a corner like they were in like the side of the room not knowing what to do but now they have a task like oh all I have to do is put water on my daughter's head like a towel water and like that's gonna help her so you know being able to give people roles but also calming them and like a urgent it could be sometimes the situation may not go well like there was this one time where the doctor was like okay like we might have to do a c-section and she was freaking out so just looking being able to look at her in the eyes and tell her listen this is gonna be okay we need to breathe let's, let's listen to what the doctor or the midwife yeah had to yeah so that ability to stay focused um, what I also heard a little bit of in there is like that general manager, project manager, like CEO kind of quality, like, okay, you do this, you do that, right? There's like a, there's like a field marshal in you, <laughs> someone who's like, all right, I'm going to, you know, so you're talking to a dad who's 30 years older than you, yeah. right? Like her dad. And, um, and you're not afraid. No, no, no. Right. So there is a little bit of that, like commander, like, this is how it's going to go right? Like the general. I mean, I'm exaggerating a little just for fun, but, but thinking about um, those kinds of roles where you are a general manager and you're looking at a lot of, you're synthesizing a lot of different aspects of, um, of something that's going on, you yeah. know? Thank you. For so that. you're welcome. <laughs> All right, you guys, this is so much fun. We should do this part more often. Um, all right. So Here's where I want to take you guys, and I hope that some of you look into the seven stories exercise from, um, ah, what is that book called? Oh, The Five O'Clock Club. All right, you can Google that online and you'll find it. Um, okay, now what we do and why I was talking to Caroline and Chelsea about this idea of your the role that you're playing and the culture or where you're doing it. So one of the things that I see people do a lot, right, is that they, they say, I need to find a job. I want to figure out what's next. I have to put together my resume, okay? And resume is basically this. It's a list of acquired experience. It is not necessarily what you were born with the DNA to do, okay? Um, what we are naturally inclined to do lives here under what I call skill-based purpose. And this concept came to me um, years ago. When I started my practice in 2008, we were in a similar free fall at the time. And I had people from financial services come to me and say, oh, Claire, it's been such a rough couple of years. I really want a sense of meaning in my work and purpose. Can you help me find a job in the nonprofit sector? And of course, now I would laugh at that, but at the time I was kind of like, oh, you know, I didn't know what to say to them because I knew that the culture of a nonprofit is so different from Wall Street that I couldn't imagine them, you know, actually being happy there. But what I realized at the time is that these people were making a mistake of thinking, well, if I'm connected to the higher purpose in a nonprofit, I will be happy. And I said, no, you won't be happy because you need to be connected to the sorts of tasks that make you happy 
every day. So for me, if I'm connecting with people and I'm in front of the room every day, I'm, I'm happy. It's like a, it's like a well that just keeps on giving. It just never dries up. Okay. Um, so same with Chelsea. If you're connecting with a woman and she's having a baby, this is something that I would imagine every single day, you know, you would be, you would be energized by that. So a lot of what gives us a sense of purpose are the tasks that we do every day. So in here, I would love to see you guys put um, some of the strengths that you've heard that you're good at, some of the strengths from the Myers-Briggs. If you can do some of that analysis from the previous pages, Myers-Briggs Strengths Finder, right? In here, uh, for example, my strengths are win others over, which is all about connection. I have communication and I love to, you know, talk and write. Um, future, so, you know, put your five uh, strengths finder skills here. Um, and then the culture, you guys heard me talking to Caroline and Chelsea about what kind of an environment do you want to be in to do what you're doing? Okay, whether it's that very cerebral, whether it's a service environment, what kind of a place, whether it's super fast paced and chaotic or very calm and nurturing, um, what is the culture? So here it could be industry, it could be size of company, it could be, um, is it domestic or international, right? These are all things that go under culture. And the idea here is to create a target for yourself, okay? What kind of organizations am I going to reach out to to try to find work, all right? Now, what you end up doing is you use the experience and the resume to sell yourself into this job. And I wanna make one thing clear, if your resume doesn't line up exactly to what you wanna do next, one of the tricks you can do is that the elements of previous jobs that you did like, you can put them closer to the top of the list. So you know when you do your three to five bullets for each job that you've had, Put the stuff you like best at the top, even if it isn't where you spent the most time, because you will make yourself look more, you're not lying, okay? You're not making up that you did something that you didn't do, but you can tweak it by showing the stuff that would have given you the experience to do what you want next, okay? Now, I hope that wasn't too confusing, but... Here's another way to help you flesh out what to do next. And I'm just looking at the time, we're good. Um, this can help you articulate new targets. Because again, I wanna pause here and, and make sure that we're all on the same page. Part of the reason, or the entire reason, that we are articulating our own targets is that trying to make yourself fit into a job that you see on LinkedIn is not an effective way to find a job. Okay, I'm gonna say that again. Trying to make yourself look like a good candidate for a job that you find on LinkedIn is not an effective way to find a job. The better way to find a job is to know exactly what company or type of company you'd like to work for and exactly what kind of job you want within that organization all right and once you know that you network your way to the people who could hire you in those jobs and that might sound daunting but that truly is the best way to do it so let's start with this idea let's say that you are the brand manager of coca-cola and you love your job, it's perfect, but your boss is like 40 years old and he or she is never leaving. So you know that you're never gonna get promoted. So in that case, you say, okay, I am brand manager of Coca-Cola, I'm going to apply for the job of brand manager over at Pepsi, or maybe in another division of Coca-Cola like Dasani Water or something like that, okay? So this is, I'm happy in my job, I just have to figure out a way to advance. So I might go to another division or another company. Over here, 
you have um, related. So this is where, what's nice about over here is that you probably already have a network here. So an example of this is after I worked at L'Oreal and then Christian Dior, I knew that I wanted to go work for one of the companies that develops fragrances. And because those people called on us at Dior, I knew them. So I was able to approach them directly and say, would you guys consider hiring me as a junior account manager um, on one of your accounts? And I got a job that way. So um, you can, so let's go back to the example of Coke and Pepsi. If you're at Pepsi, you might say, or Coke, I forget which one I started with, but you might say, oh, you know what? I want to work for a bottle manufacturer, or I want to work for a flavor company, or I want to work for a distribution company, or I want to go work for our advertising agency. Okay. Um, you might that, so the advert, uh, the, the distribution or one of the retailers, maybe you want to go work for one of the supermarket chains or Walmart, right? That would be a customer. Or again, you want to work in a different department. So maybe you say, you know what? I still love Coke. I think it's a fantastic company, but I realized I don't like marketing, right? This is what happened to me. I don't like marketing. I want to go into finance or I want to go into sales or I want to go into um, procurement. Okay, so these are ways, this, when people are trying to find what's next for them, this often, often yields some pretty good stuff because chances are you're, you're not that far. I always say whenever I've changed jobs, I've ended up coming back to about 80% of where I was. It never ended up being the radical change that I imagined it would be, you know, where you have the the one who's like an investment banker and then he becomes a, a ambulance driver you know or an emt it's just that's very rare i think most of us go into something and then transition in a kind of a quiet way and the good news with that is that it's not as difficult as a radical change okay my change to coaching was much more challenging than my change from marketing to sales so here we have off the beaten path um, and when you're in a job search, assuming you know you found some good targets here, down here you can find things where you want to practice interviewing. So maybe it's something that you've done in the past um, that you put away, and it could be interesting. And that's in that scenario that EMT might you know maybe you have this like long lost dream. Um, but for most of us this off the beaten path can look a little bit like, you know what, I am gonna interview at Pepsi even though I know I don't want that job because I need interview practice, okay? So that's that. Here you put your dream job. And the thing about a dream job, this is interesting. I, I remember doing a workshop once where a woman described her dream job and it turned out to be the job that she had she just said, oh, it kills me because I only have two weeks of vacation a year. And I said, well, you've been there for three years and you're good at it. What if you negotiated a third week of vacation? And she was like, oh, you know. So the thing about describing the dream job is that you don't, it, don't worry about the title. Focus on the experience and the elements of that job. Okay. So now, here we're going to get in a little bit to the messaging of how do you get the job, but I want to stop here and just see, I don't know if we have time to do more coaching, but are there any questions right here? Who's got questions? You can just unmute yourself and speak up. Elle has her hand raised. Hi, um, how do you suggest evaluating whether or not a job will actually be what it entails? Because when you're going through the interview process, everybody has their best face on, you know, you want to impress them, they want to impress you. And I've been in a few roles where, you know, it was promised or what was exciting or got me really excited about the job before did not pan out once I was on the job. So yeah. thoughts around navigating that. Okay, so and do you want to take two questions at once, Claire, or do you want to answer that one first? Um, let me answer that one first, because that actually, uh, 
I had a scenario once where I was fired from a job and then when I, it turned out that the woman before me had not been fired because she was an internal promotion and everybody loved her, but the three people before her had been fired from the job. <laughs> so, you know, you have to do due diligence. And um, sometimes what people do is that I think you can, you can, in all honesty, just ask the people you're interviewing with, could I speak to a couple of the people on the team? Okay, that's one way to do it. You could also go on LinkedIn and find people, you know, alumni from uh, the schools you've been to and see if any of them have worked at that organization and get a sense of, um, of uh, you know, of whether it's true or not. My one caveat to all this is that if it's happened multiple times to you, um, I would get a little curious about where, where is the clarity and where is the clarity getting lost, right, in the conversation. And that might be something, is the same thing happening over and over again? Then you have to get curious about um, how are you understanding what they're telling you? Uh, anyway, but primarily, I think you can ask to speak to other people in the organization who are at your level. And if they won't let you do that, you can find some on LinkedIn. So, all right, is that all the questions for now? Um, okay, so the last, in the last, oh, nine minutes, we have tons of time. So you guys, what I want you to do, and we started with the peak experience, and I think we saw with a little bit of coaching we did today, which was great, um, is that our strengths, and, and I bet you if, you if we looked at Caroline and Chelsea, we would see strengths either in the Strengths Finder or in the MT, MBTI that corresponded to their the experiences that they described, right? So what I want you to think about is writing down one or two of your strengths and then thinking, what does that strength do for a team, right? So if you're the one who keeps people calm, right? Um, I know now that I have a business in coaching, to be honest, I always knew that sales was an important role, but I really, really understand it now because there's so many talented coaches who are incredible at service delivery and they don't know how to sell. And so, you know, they're struggling in their businesses and, um, and it's really hard to see. So if you are really, really good at sales, maybe you wanna work for a company that has a product or a service that you truly believe in and you can help get the word out. Right, so that would be a place where if your strength is in sales, your impact on your team and colleagues is that you can get these service professionals, for example, uh, to get out there doing their good work in the world, right? And then that helps the company in the bottom line. Another example I often use of this is, you know, let's say you're like a research analyst and you're really good at what you do, um, but you don't really love being in front of the client and doing client facing stuff, but you might be able to support your sales team and your sales colleagues by being that person in the room who really has like the nitty gritty difficult answers that nobody either knows or has the patience for. And what you do is that by attending uh, sales meetings or client meetings with your salespeople, you give them this incredible sense of confidence and they can really stretch themselves and go out on a limb because they know they have you to answer the difficult questions, the technical questions, if something comes up, right? So what that does is it allows your sales team to have much greater confidence. And that in turn might mean that they'd be more successful with the clients they already have. And maybe they would be willing to reach farther to clients they don't currently have. Okay, so then that in turn helps the company and the bottom line. So this little, I call it the strengths bullseye. Um, 
I just want you to be thinking, I know we think like, God, I'm 28 years old, I'm 32 years old, how could I possibly have an impact on the bottom line? I'm not in sales. But we all have an indirect line to the bottom line. Even if you're in HR and you, you know, make the team feel safer and more productive, if you help resolve conflict between people so that there's less turnover, all of that reduces expenses and helps the bottom line. So I want you to be thinking about how you connect to helping a company, okay? And here we get into, based on that, what can you contribute? So here we have um, someone I worked with a while ago who, she was a project manager and she was project managing data transition, right? Or data, I forget what they call it, but you know, taking companies online. And uh, she was really good at creating a pathway, but she was also really good at talking to the stick in the muds um, because there were a lot of people, it was a traditional environment, talk about culture. So it was like a lot of people, it was publishing, it was a very traditional environment. And those people were not inclined to like see this online future, right? So two of her really core skills were the road mapping and project management, but also um, getting people unstuck and getting people to let go and convincing them to be open to the change. Okay, and uh, at some point she was interviewing to do an online retail to, to she was interviewing with consulting firms um, to help them build that data transition uh, specialization. So here, when you talk about this is what I think I could do, right? So we were talking before, like the third issue is how do I get the job? You get the job by figuring out your target. What are the companies? What are the people I want to work for? And then start to communicate with them. So this would be either the beginning of an email, just the first paragraph of an email, dear so-and-so as a project manager, this is what I'm looking to do. Um, and, you know, what's, I, I won't say more. Um, but this could also be the opening of when you are at a networking event and people ask you what you do, okay? Uh, and then you wanna have memorable supporting evidence. So, you know, at the New York Times, I studied readership data and advised the editors, the challenge was in guiding an established organization through major change, right? So imagine such an old school organization with a lot of people very fixed in their in their beliefs and their mindset and and convincing them to go online. Um, here's another one at a previous consultancy. Uh, she had been chosen to be the face of a project for clients because she was very good at explaining unfamiliar topics to clients with mature businesses. Right. So basically positioning yourself as I can help people change the way they think about new technologies. And that's what I could do for you. So in, in ex, just in the way that you're explaining things, you are making people see that you understand their business challenges. You know, I know that it's hard for you to get business uh, to do data transformation with established industries or older industries that are not startups, right? So now this can be, um, oh, sorry, this can be um, uh, once you write that initial paragraph, right, this could literally be the two following paragraphs in an email to somebody or it could be now I don't necessarily recommend bombarding somebody on LinkedIn with this you want to create a relationship first but this could also be if somebody if you're at a networking event and somebody says oh that's really interesting you want to work for consultancy and you say yeah you know when I was at blah 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 and then I this other you know so if somebody engages with you you can go ahead and tell these two now these three simple paragraphs together are 
I call it the impact statement, but it's basically an elevator pitch. It's not like, oh, look at me. I worked at all these places. I went to Columbia. I'm so smart. Nobody wants a laundry list of your experience. What they want is, this is what I'm good at, and this is what I can do for you. Okay? Um, and I don't know why there's something in the middle of my PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> All right. Um, so basically, you guys, the way that I do what I do, I call it I to the fourth power because what I find is that people go about job search very backwards. They find jobs online, or first of all, they say, I have to put together my resume. They make a list of everything they've ever done, half of which they'd never want to do again, but then they limit themselves by that. Then they go out onto LinkedIn and look for job openings, and then they try to shove themselves into that. And I'm not saying that everybody gets to swing on the beach with all this freedom all the time, but I think in my experience, we forget to begin with ourselves and understand what do I want? What is the impact I can have? What energizes me? Okay, and then we look to the marketplace. And in this, in this scenario, because I also use this for, for anyway, um, in this scenario, influences. I know what I want, I know the impact, how do I sell and market myself effectively to hiring managers, right? And then how do I take initiative, which means go out there and go to the networking events and uh, do all the stuff, even though um, it's scary and I don't like to do it. And you know, you gotta go through a lot of no's to get to yeses. Um, but, the reason I advocate for taking a more assertive approach to all of this is that what I hear people, people want freedom, right? They want the autonomy of a job where they're trusted and valued. They want recognition. I can't tell you the number of times people say to me, Claire, I just want to be recognized. I just want, you know, people to know about the good work that I do. And then we all want balance. You know, we're living in a crazy, crazy, even before coronavirus, um, we're living in a crazy time. And I think that doing things that energize you, with that energizing also comes, um, there's a restorative quality to it right? Um, it's like that rest and recreation. You recreate yourself when you do things that give you energy and make you feel good. Um, and that brings a lot of balance. You know, our lives are not that balanced, as Anjali showed us, right, with between the kids and the this and the that. But at the very least, if we can be doing things that we enjoy and that energize us, then we can hope to regain a little bit of it.